When looking at your own blood panel or blood chemistry report, the extent at which you understand what those markers mean should be in the context of how you feel, how you function, what your current state is, identify what you would like your future state to be, and then come up with a strategy to get there. How you feel and function matters a lot, and sometimes your blood chemistry can give you a clue as to why you may be feeling and functioning the way you do. In other words, you want to know your current state, you want to identify where you want to go, and you want to know how to get there. To do all of this, you you do not need to become a medical doctor, but you do need to become literate in this language and you do need to get involved. You cannot be a passive bystander when it comes to your health and just wait for there to be something wrong to have an expert come and save the day. Let your doctors look at your blood panel in the context of disease, in the context of managing a problem or avoiding a crisis. That's their job, that's what they're good at. Your job is to be responsible for yourself to become an expert in what you need to express health and to achieve the goals you want to achieve and your blood work can be a wealth of information to provide that and it's not that difficult to understand and that's why we're here. Now this video is going to discuss the second half of the fuel equation and that has to do with hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Basically the three types of food that you could eat. Now the first half of the equation was on oxygen so we discussed a lot about looking at your red blood cells and how important it is to have some basic nutrients for healthy red blood cells which deliver oxygen. Before we get to the other half of that equation I want to make sure that you hit the subscribe button if you're not a subscriber and the notification bell so that Anytime we put out another video, you're notified so you can be right on top of the latest information that we're presenting. My name is Dr. Steven Janopoulos, better known as at Dr. Steven G on all of the social media platforms. The reason why we discuss fuel the way we do is because your cells are a lot like an automobile. And most people understand that for an automobile to function, you have to have air enter the engine at the same time as gasoline, where you have combustion in the engine that creates energy and power to create what we would call horsepower and then your vehicle can move. Well the cells in your body are very similar in that they like the automobile have an engine we call it the mitochondria where oxygen and glucose kind of like air and gasoline mix into that engine combusts creates energy that we call ATP. So we talked about oxygen now we're going to talk about the other half of that equation which is the hydrocarbon which could be glucose it could be fatty acid it could be lactate it could be protein but Either way, it works the same way. Oxygen and fuel combust in the engine called the mitochondria to give us energy called ATP. Now, before we discuss the markers on your blood panel that give us this information, we want to talk a little bit about how important it is to have the right fuel mixture in the engine. So, as you can imagine, back in the old days before we had fuel injection, I remember my first cars didn't have fuel injection. They had what's called a, uh, a carburetor. And it was very possible for you to create abnormal mixtures where there's too much fuel. We would say you're flooding the engine and the car wouldn't run. You're flooding it with fuel. Well, this can happen with some of the hydrocarbons as well, particularly glucose. We usually get into trouble when the one of the three major sources of fuel, carbohydrate or glucose, is in an abundance. So we always say that in your blood, on your blood test, the ideal sweet spot for your fasting glucose is 85 milligrams per deciliter. Or we say anywhere between between 82 and 92 is the sweet spot. That correlates to you having in your five liters of blood, that's how much blood you have in your body. If I were to take all of your blood and put it into a bucket, on my desk it would be about a five liter bucket, pretty sizable. And in that bucket at any given time, 90 minutes after a meal, nine hours after a meal, nine days after a meal, nine weeks after a meal, it doesn't matter. If you're alive, you should have one teaspoon of sugar in your five liters and that correlates to that 82 to 92 number on your fasting glucose. If you were to have a teaspoon and a half of sugar in your five liters, you would be diabetic. If you were to have a half a teaspoon in your five liters, you would be in a coma. So that's how tightly regulated sugar is in your bloodstream. Even if you were to eat a giant chocolate cake with a whole bunch of teaspoons of sugar in there, within 90 minutes your body's going to do backflips to release all kinds of hormones in order to remove that extra sugar out of your bloodstream to get it back to that single teaspoon, to get it back to the 82 to 92 number. Why? Because glucose is so incredibly important to you being alive that it must be managed within a very tight range. Now an analogy here is your body temperature. Your body temperature could be also something that is very tightly regulated. You know, if you're in the Arctic Circle and it's 40 degrees below zero, your body will do backflips to stay at 98.6 
basics for your core body temperature. And if you are in the desert and it's 120 degrees outside, well, your body will then do backflips in order to keep that core body temperature at 98.6. If you go to 99.6, you've all have woken up one morning quite you know, not feeling well and you check your temperature and it's 99.6 and you say, oh, look, I have a low grade fever. There must be a problem. Again, it's not deadly to be 99.6, but you just don't feel right. You're not functioning as well as you should. That's because that very narrow range has been violated. So just like with your body temperature, your blood sugar needs to be in that very narrow range. And what happens to most of us, what we can identify in your blood work is this loss of the ability to manage that number, either on the high side or on the low side. Most people have trouble on the high side, but many people have trouble on the low side. So fasting glucose, 82 to 92 is the sweet spot. As you get into the mid to upper 90s, you're now seeing your fasting glucose go up. Now, what happens if you go to more than a teaspoon? Well, if you go to more than a teaspoon, that sugar starts to stick to things, right? Sugar's sticky. If you stick your elbow in a bunch of sugar on your counter and you lift your elbow up, it'll be sticky, right? Sugar is sticky. It will stick to proteins in your body. The sugar can render the proteins unusable. One of the proteins that we measure how much sugar is stuck to it is called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein that if you remember from the previous discussion on oxygen on red blood cells, hemoglobin is the protein inside the red blood cell made from iron that binds oxygen, right? There's a position on that protein called A1C. When we check your blood, we check it for sugar being attached to the A1C position on that hemoglobin. Well, that number is a percentage. So of all of your red blood cells, if 4.8 to 5.2 percent of those red blood cells are experiencing this sugar attachment, well, then you're in a good zone. If that number goes from 5.3 to 5.6, we say you're becoming insulin resistant. For the most part, there's other things that would interfere with that number being as accurate as we'd like it to be. But for all intents and purposes of this video, 5.3 to 5.6 is insulin resistance, 5.7 to 6.4 is pre-diabetes, a disease, and then 6.5 and above is frank diabetes. A lot of people think pre-diabetes is a pre-disease that, oh, I have prediabetes, I better watch it, otherwise I might one day get diabetes. No, prediabetes is a disease, okay? So we just mentioned two markers on your blood test, fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C, that are important in telling us about your blood sugar status. However, fasting glucose is something that can be fooled in the short term. Different things can affect it, but A1C is pretty darn stable. It's kind of a 90-day window and looking backwards. You can't just kind of two days before your blood test start eating well and then fix your A1C. That's not gonna happen. You can probably do that with fasting glucose, but either way, these are two good numbers to have. Now, if those numbers are off, well, then we have a little bit of a problem because that means the sugar story has already started. So the question then becomes is, there, are there any other markers to tell us about your blood sugar other than those two? And the answer is yes. So another number that we want you to look at on your blood test that most of your blood tests are gonna have is something called triglycerides. Now, triglycerides are in the lipid section, in the fat section of your blood work. And a lot of people think, oh, if my triglycerides are high, then I must be eating too much fat. And although that could be true, it's usually not true. Usually your triglycerides climb when there's a blood sugar problem. So allow me to explain. When you eat that chocolate cake, right? And you're trying to get rid of all this extra sugar, you can only store so much. You can store about 400 calories in your liver. You can store about 1600 calories in your muscles. But after that, if your muscles are full and your liver is full, where are you gonna put that extra sugar? And if your body certainly doesn't want it circulating around, creating stickiness and problems with your red blood cells, and then all of a sudden you can't deliver oxygen because your A1C percentage is going up. Well, then we send it to the liver. The liver kind of comes to the rescue. It converts that sugar into fat called triglyceride, and then you take that extra triglyceride and you store it in your body fat. You kind of take it and you dump it onto a vehicle that comes by called LDL cholesterol, and then you deliver that triglyceride around the body and you deposit it into your fat cells. Now there are other, there's chylomicrons and other, but we're trying to keep this simple. So when your liver starts to produce these triglycerides, that number will climb above 100. Your laboratory reference range might say 149 as being the high. So if you're 139, you're like, all right, I'm good. No, you're not. We don't want you anywhere near 100. We want you well below 100. So 
So elevated triglycerides are a clue about what's going on. It's kind of like a canary in the coal mine telling you that your blood sugar story is starting to take hold. So for example, if you're super efficient and pretty young, your fasting glucose and your A1C might be spot on, but your triglycerides might be 120, fasting triglycerides. That's an earlier clue. Now, another clue is looking at your triglyceride to HDL ratio. There's in the lipid section, you have total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, some people call L standing for lousy cholesterol or bad cholesterol. And then HDL is what some people would call the good cholesterol. We'll get to that one in the next video as to why those are called good and bad. But for the most part, when your triglyceride to HDL ratio is approaching the number two, it's an early sign of insulin resistance, meaning a blood sugar problem. So even before fasting glucose goes up, before A1C goes up, maybe even before triglycerides breaks the 100 barrier, if the ratio of triglycerides to HDL, so if your triglycerides are 90 and your HDL is 40, that's a greater than two to one ratio. It's an early, early sign of insulin resistance, something to pay attention to. Now, this is important for those of you who are young. This is important for people who are genetically okay with having standard American diet for the first 30 years of their life. And if you want to identify if there's an issue, you can say, my fasting glucose is spot on 85, my A1C is 5.2, spot on. My triglycerides are 90, but my HDL is 40. That triglyceride to HDL ratio is above two. That could be an early sign because again, eventually what's going to happen is your triglycerides are going to cross the 100 barrier. Your ability to dispose of the extra sugar as you become more sedentary, if you don't make the lifestyle and dietary changes, well then what's going to happen? You're going to then start to see that A1C start to climb. And again, that makes it a little bit too late. It's not not too late, but it makes it more difficult. So what we want to do is pretty much say, okay, fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1C, triglycerides, fasting triglycerides, triglyceride to HDL ratio. And then if we look at your liver enzymes, so if you look at the section in what's called the metabolic panel, you'll see two, it's called AST and ALT. Sometimes it's written as SGPT and SGOT. Those are two of the major liver enzymes. Both are important, but those numbers represent basically traffic. I always like to say if, if your liver is one-way bridge going from the inside of your body to the outside of your body and the cars in that bridge represent toxins you just want to get rid of, right? Well, when traffic goes up, the liver works fine. It's moving the traffic across the liver, across the bridge. But if there's traffic, well, then you're going to have a backup of the toxins on the inside of the body and that those numbers should be well below 25. We prefer them in the teens. When AST and ALT start to approach 25 and go higher than 25, it's early signs of what we would call fatty liver with ALT being the one that's even more associated with blood sugar. So when you see that ALT number start to climb into the mid 20s and above, then you know you're starting to manufacture more fats. You're starting to take that sugar or carbohydrate that you cannot store or burn, convert it into fats and start delivering those fats around the body for storage. Again, this is all normal, but when we see those numbers start to rise, we can say, hey, this is a clue as to what's coming, okay? So this is the best way to understand the second half of the fuel equation. Now, what we'll also see is that people who are already have, you know, prediabetes, their inflammatory markers will be higher just as a result of sugar being kind of pro-inflammatory, but those are secondary characteristics. What we discussed here in this video is a great place for you to start on your blood work to identify early blood sugar challenges as it relates to your diet and lifestyle. Not something that needs to be treated medically, hopefully, but rather an I, something you can identify as being a problem. Now, what are are you going to do about it, right? What are you going to do with this information? Well, a good thing to do is to make sure you have more storage capacity for your extra carbohydrate. Those are your muscles. Don't let your muscles shrink. If you can get them to grow, get them to grow. Resistance exercise for sure. And of course, depleting your glycogen or your stored sugar on a regular basis is a good idea, right? regular exercise. Resistance exercise creates a bigger sink for you to put that extra carbohydrate into that gives you more muscle, but cardiovascular exercise that burns calories is going to use up more of your sugar stores so you have room for what you're going to eat that next day or later on in the day. So exercise is a great way to handle that, but also having a diet that's lower in carbohydrate. What we're finding is that lowering your carbohydrates as you get older is probably a good idea because your ability to dispose of the extra carbohydrate decreases with 
age. What happens is the hormone called insulin that you make to help pull the sugar out of the blood, you become more resistant to it. And as we get older, our muscles tend to get smaller. So our sink starts to get smaller. We can't hold what we once could hold. So as we get older, it's a good idea to go on a lower carbohydrate type of diet and to maintain as much of that insulin sensitivity as possible. Now on blood test, if your doctor orders or if you go to a laboratory and order it for yourself, you can order your fasting insulin. Now look at it this way. If I eat this much food and I need this much insulin when I'm 15 years old to properly store it away, well maybe at 35 or 40 or 45 years old, I can eat that same amount of food and need this much insulin in order to dispose of it. So that means I'm becoming more resistant to the hormone insulin. So your fasting insulin, I target it for myself to be as low as possible. I actually prefer laboratory low fasting insulin. Now for my patients, I've typically tried to target them for the number six. I don't like it above six. Now your laboratory might say 18 for being high. Well, I think that's ridiculous. Certainly, you know, six is where I would target my clients and patients with under 10 is better. I mean, it's good, but anything above 10, I would definitely say, hey, it's time to get this number down. Again, preferably below six. For myself, I target it below three. So the lower, the better for fasting insulin, indicating that I'm more insulin resistant. Now, there's a lot of information out there when it comes to blood sugar and using a CGM or a continuous glucose monitor. I think that's a great idea for the self-experimenters out there. If you're one of those people, by all means, you can identify actually which foods in you will cause your glucose to spike. It's different in different people. There are people who can eat a potato and their glucose just doesn't really rise a whole lot. Say it rises to 120, but they could eat the same amount of white rice and it could spike to 145. And it could be the opposite for someone else. So a CGM or continuous glucose monitor is a great way to self-experiment if you're inclined to do so. I don't like to count calories. I don't like to constantly measure things. I do like to get my blood work done four times a year and do the other assessments that we discuss in all of my videos. But a CGM I've done several times for self-experimentation so I can better communicate with you, but it's not something that I use as a gauge for everything that I do. It does help in identifying a poor night's sleep. It does help in identifying, in my opinion, what would be excess cortisol in my system, which usually comes from poor sleep, not necessarily stress. So a CGM can be a good self-experiment for a three-month time in your life, and you could do that let's just say every couple of years to see if, if there's information that you can glean from that. But for the most part, everything we discussed here today is all you would need to know about your blood tests and how they relate to the second half of the fuel equation, which is hydrocarbons. And hydrocarbons, again, are carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, and how those are used for fuel. And that being together with oxygen as how we derive energy. So next time, we're gonna be discussing the lipid story. So we're gonna go into the triglyceride, LDL, cholesterol story a little bit more. We're gonna talk more about fat burning. We're gonna talk more about being in ketosis. So don't feel like we skipped a whole section. Have a great day.